I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, but first I just want to take a second to thank Sarah Lippincott for the enormous amount of work that she's done to make this event happen. So, I don't know if everybody realizes that Sarah is responsible for the lion's share of all of the arrangements for this forum, uh, and she's been doing an amazing job. Um, <laughs> So, uh, our closing keynote. Um, can I see a quick show of hands? How many people use or have used open journal systems, open conference systems, or yes. open monograph systems? Whoa. Yes, great. So, our closing keynote speaker is the founder of the Public Knowledge Project, which is responsible for all of those software platforms. Dr. John Malinsky is a professor of publishing studies at Simon Fraser University and the Kosla family professor. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, Kosla. Kosla. Uh, of Education and Director of the Program in Science, Technology, and Society at Stanford University. Um, I'm not going to enumerate all of his accomplishments, there's a bio in your program, um, but he's the author of a number of books on topics ranging from the Oxford English Dictionary to open access and has been a real driving force in the rapidly changing world of scholarly communication. It's hard to overstate his impact on the world of library publishing uh, as a it's scholar, high. as an advocate, and the founder of a massively useful organization. So I'm very pleased to introduce him as our closing keynote speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Molinsky. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Melanie. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, a long time since I've actually had a chance to speak to librarians. Um, and it, it's preaching to the converted in one level, um, but it's like coming home in, in, in another level. Uh, the Public Knowledge Project has been a partnership with libraries, not when it first started, but very quickly after. I realized that there would be no future for public knowledge uh, unless there was library involvement, unless I could get some kind of partnership or collaboration going. And I want to speak to you today um, about a dilemma that comes from success. I want to speak to you about the success of open access and where we need to go with that. And I am going to come back to the notion of collaboration. In fact, I'm going to come back to a collaboration with the libraries of an extent I hadn't imagined before. And that is I want to move from collaboration to cooperation. And I understand that Martin had that kind of theme in his uh, opening talk. And I have to tell you, a new level of Twitter graciousness has been introduced by Martin Eve. Tears welled up in my eyes yesterday when I saw a tweet in which Franny, are you here Franny? In which Franny said, this, you gave such a wonderful talk Martin, it was so filled with eloquence and motivation, was so in, it's only 143 characters. <laughs> and Martin responded, Thank you so much, Franny, but John Walensky will be good tomorrow <laughs> as well. Now, he had 30 or 40 more characters he could have added a bit to that. I thought he cut himself short, but I just have to note that that sets a new level. And, and I've known Martin for a, a little while, but never as well as, as, as that comment uh, warranted. So what I want to talk about today, and, and, and I want to say also that this coming at the end, I was a little apprehensive, but it is amazing. This looks like a full house. Nobody has left for the airport. Nobody is out in the spring gorgeous day of Portland's return from spring break with spring arriving. The tree, look at, just as we, I speak, the leaves are coming out on the trees here. It's a little different where I live, but at any rate, it, I, I want to have this opportunity to talk to you about this notion of cooperation. And in fact, I want to propose a cooperative. But first, I want to start with a fairly heavy program for the last talk on a whatever day it is now, Monday afternoon. And that is about intellectual property and the intellectual history of intellectual property and the role of learning. We're going to cover 1,000, 1,300 years in the next 20 or 30 minutes. We're going to whiz through John Locke's philosophy of property, and we're going to end up with a notion that we have a problem that we can solve. The success I was mentioning earlier is that open access, I don't need to tell you, this is the pleasure of being here, I don't need to open 
and convince you about the success and the promise of open access. It's a done deal. We've way, we're way past that tipping point. Elsevier and Springer are falling over themselves with their open access journals. Barack Obama's White House has every window declaring it will be open. The fencing they're improving, but the windows they're opening on open access. So we have federal policies, we have corporate publishers, we have always had the libraries. This is the situation that we have, though. We have a new economic model that will not work only in two areas, all of the social sciences and all of the humanities. <laughs> I wished for open access, I got open access, and now I got to fix open access, and I can only do it in collaboration and cooperation with you. It is an intellectual property issue. And the intellectual property issue is one of a distinction we need to make around learning. Not all intellectual property is the same. That's already a fact. That's already a part of American law. We have exceptions and exemptions for learning. Fair use is a factor in learning. In criticism, yes. In parody, my favorite, although Weird Al Yankovic would always get permission. Michael Jackson and Weird Al were like on the phone to each other. How do you feel about it? And Michael's like, well, let's see the hair. And, and it was a whole thing going on. But America has, and Canada too, has, in fact, entire intellectual property world, although there is some question about whether it is universally applicable, the fair use stipulation. But not only fair use for copying texts and for using quotations and for putting scholarly work into, into other, sorry, borrowing scholarly work to create scholarly work. We even have it in patents. It's a little questionable in patents, but there is a common law patent exception for research. And when the DNA case, who can own DNA, went to the Supreme Court, Myriad Genetics was very proud of the 8,000 articles that had been, 8,000 research articles that had used BRA, BRCA1 and BRCA2, I don't want to go too far into this, but had used their patented DNA, which turned out to be an illegitimate patent, but at any rate, they said that we let everyone do research on it, so what's the problem with us having a monopoly on a test, a diagnostic test for breast cancer that we charge $4,000 for and no one can get a second opinion on, we let people do research on it. And as offensive as I found Myriad's arguments, because Myriad comes out of the University of Utah and uh, Children's Hospital in Toronto, Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto and Penn as well, the research comes out of a federally funded grant. And that research was used in a way that many of us thought was questionable, but they still protected that notion that learning has a distinct intellectual property state that allows it to be used for learning. I want you to hold this in your head that intellectual property and learning are, form a distinct class, and we've lost sight of it, particularly in relationship to the libraries and publishing. And this coalition, which I'm going to nudge towards cooperation, this coalition is about that. This coalition needs to recognize that the steps that you have made in forming this organization is very much a declaration that learning is a distinct form of intellectual property, the value of which is not realized in a commercial market to the same degree that it is fully realized in a commons. A commons like the library across the way, wherever that is, I was just there, get a little disoriented here, a commons like the Portland Central Library, which I had the pleasure of walking through this morning, on my way here, that is a vibrant hub of a commons. The Central Library was built in 20, no, 19, oh, 1913. They had their 100th anniversary. The librarian very proudly told me as I was admiring the ceiling fixtures from Restoration Hardware, I'm sure. But at any rate, the, the sense of the library as a public space, and I saw that the terminals were full of people sitting 
and using the computers, having almost no access to research, but from a photographic point of view, the terminals in this state university library and the terminals in the public library are no different. People are fascinated, absorbed, and learning. And what we want to do through this cooperation is connect the two. The public library represents a more open and public space than the university library today, and you are part of a group that is changing that. And we need to think strategically about how to do that, and we need to think from principles. And the principle I'm talking to you about today is the distinctive intellectual properties of learning. Those distinct properties are recognized in law in the patent exception and fair use tax exemption. I come from the University of Tax Exemption Donors. I don't know if you know this one. The University of Tax, U-D-E-D. -E no, you know, I didn't get that right, did I? Work on that. <laughs> we also have the academic exception in law. Now, in common law, this is not a statute, which says that I own my own intellectual property, not so much with patents, but certainly with copyright. And so do all of you, and so do the students who attend your library, and so do the faculty who visit as well. And that academic exception says that something's going on in the university that is different and distinct in terms of the creation of intellectual property. It can be commercialized. Myriad Genetics took a, a process, a biochemical process from the University of Utah and created a patented process that it commercialized to the extreme. It has since backed off, by the way. In January, it withdrew all of its lawsuits against every single provider that suggested they could, provide, they could offer a similar kind of test, so all credit to Myriad. But this idea that the university is producing a different kind of intellectual property is something that we do not have in the publishing realm, and yet we have it almost everywhere else and where does that coherence come from, from history? What I want to argue with the next 1,300 years of history that I am going to spill before you in four distinct episodes, this is like a little bit of binge watching of the History Channel I'm about to present for you here. Are you ready to 1.5 times forward on this? This history is to argue that intellectual property was conceived in the world of learning, not in the world of commerce, and that we conceived of intellectual property, that is, that a text could have properties, and those properties are distinctly intellectual. That's a gift from learning. And that that intellectual property of learning has value as it exists apart from the world and a part of the world. That's a little hard to do orally. Are you getting the distinction between the A and the P? That the intellectual property is a part of the world, and the intellectual, intellectual property is a part, no, sorry, I just blew it, a part from the world. Okay, those two distinctions. And I want to show you how those operated have operated historically. A further quality of the intellectual properties of learning, a really important one that in fact I caught the tail end of, is that the intellectual properties of learning are sponsored. They're not sold. They're not marketed. They're not discounted. They're not negotiable. They are sponsored in advance. They are endowed. There's beneficence behind the creation of the intellectual properties of learning. And we have lost sight of the claims and responsibilities of accepting that sponsorship, that endowment, that beneficence. And history that's just about to unfold, these are just the credits rolling right now, the history that's just about to unfold is, is going to demonstrate that. I want to start with the theory, because I'm a professor. I could start with the exciting elements of swords and, and castles and monasteries and monks and nuns and heaven knows, but let me just start with the theory. John Locke is the theory that I want to just quickly introduce in terms of intellectual property. Locke, in fact, one of the great pleasures of coming to America uh, from Canada eight years ago was the building I was assigned to, the Coverley building at Stanford, has Locke's name engraved on the outside, not the only name, they have such esteemed educators as Peter Abelard, 
do not follow his example in brackets after it. Peter Abelard, uh, Plato, Locke, Comenius, not Erasmus, not John Dewey, Jane Addams, and a few other distinguished figures are, are, are carved in relief in the stone of, 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 of the building. Um, but the second thing is that Locke has really been called and been challenged as the philosopher of America. He never made it here. He used it as an example. And the important principle, and I don't want to give you too much of this because it's, it is late, it is early afternoon, but it will seem late in a moment, is the two treatises of John Locke on government, on civil government. In the second treatise, he has a chapter of property. The chapter before, by the way, is of slavery, and his record is abominable. His record is inexcusable in this regard. But let me focus on property because it has had a huge influence, and part of that influence has been on slavery. John Locke says in, the pro in his theory on property, the chapter of property, and the most important thing he says, in fact, is it begins with the world given in common. There is no natural property. There's a natural right that he will describe, but this idea that the world begins as given in common. Whether you use reason or turn to revelation, he says, the world is given in common, and we're going to hold to that point because it means that any creation of private property has to be justified against its value in the commons. And your libraries defend that principle because they say that no book can be locked up that cannot be recalled by an undergraduate student when I'm very busily involved in using that book with the clock already started on a $30 a day fine for me to return that book because I cannot justify the privatization of that book that I borrowed from the library because the library is a commons and that's where the world begins. And Locke talks about how it is we can then justify by natural right or natural law a theory of property. And he talks about the first property that we possess is ourselves. We each have a property in ourselves. Our bodies, ourselves. Does that ring a bell? I hope so. It should ring a bell in everyone's head. The Boston Women's Health Collective in the 1970s caused a revolution in health on the principle of our bodies, ourselves, do not belong to doctors, do not belong to the state but belong to us. And the principle of democracy is entirely invested in each of us having this property in ourselves that we represent with each vote and with each political action that we take. And then Locke said labor can justify property, that if we work on something, we have a claim in it. We have a property in it. In fact, he uses this odd concept or construct that we have a property in something, not that we own it, but that we have a property in something. And this to me is a highly scholarly construct. That is, when I work on John Locke, and I, you can imagine how I'm di disappointed I was when I discovered I wasn't the first. <laughs> when I finally made it up to the stacks and saw the literature on Locke and said, whoa, that's a pretty impressive shh, and followed shelf after shelf of the work on Locke, and what could I do with Locke but gain the slightest property in Locke by studying him for years? And that's what we do. We have a property in the work that we do. We do not own it. We have a property, and we only have that property through the use of others' work. And the intellectual property of learning is a double. The work I'm giving you right now that is, the work I'm giving you right now, is my intellectual property, is my intellectual property, because I'm creating it, a bit on the spot, but it's all well, ooh, upside down. <laughs> it's all well rehearsed. But that property that I've created really belongs to a tradition of scholarship. And my double use, my double right, is a right of use. I have a right to use Locke. I have a right to use... Alan Tully, I have a right to use other scholars. And in that right, 
James Tully, sorry, yeah. I have a, an obligation to, to credit other people's work. And what we have in the intellectual property of learning is a credit system. Not Alan Tully, James Tully. Not Jim Tully, James Tully. A great Locke scholar. And his work I've used in order to strengthen my own work. In fact, he's something of a hero uh, of mine, but I don't have time to explain why, because Locke is a difficult figure and Tully manages to, to handle it exactly right. He turns against Locke in a way. But anyway, this idea that we have intellectual properties of learning that have within them an obligation and a right. An obligation to credit, a right to use. Now, Locke's argument is about private property. And Locke talks also about the limits of use. And that is you cannot let things spoil or you, you, you lose the right to them. You cannot take too much, because that leads to spoilage. So that your property rights have to be justified by the use value, the use to others. Now I want you to just hold this in your head. He talks about increasing the common stock. That justifies property. If I take a book out of the library, nobody else can have it for that short period of time, six-day window at Stanford, for an undergraduate can irritatingly recall it because they saw me carrying it out of the library, I'm almost certain, and filed a request for the book before the door had even closed. <laughs> that six-day window is only justified by what I create, by what I put back into the library. My use of lock, my closing off of lock, as if it was an apple orchard and I closed it off so no deer I've been working with St. Augustine, it should be pears. A pear orchard with no pears that St. Augustine as a young lad can come in and steal. That's justified because it creates a lot of pears and that drives down the price of pears and therefore that private property really benefits everybody. And there's a similar sensibility to the intellectual properties of learning but there's a huge distinction. And let me show you how the distinction works because when I was finished with Locke, and thought I had a property of Locke in my head, I realized that it was just a theory. It would not answer the question fully and completely, why is there a distinct class of intellectual property associated with learning, and why can I stand before you and make a claim that we need to get behind it? I needed something more substantial than a theory. And even though I'm a theory head from way back, sometimes people want practical, absolute instances that are dramatic and can be filmed and shown on the History Channel. And I've got some. Monasteries. Let me go back. So I realized that the best example of a world held in common historically in terms of the Western tradition was early medieval monasticism. Because in the monastery, all the property is held in common. And in that early period after the fall of Rome, you're watching the slides? <laughs> fall of Rome, burning. Horses, Visigoths, okay, good, all right, let's move on. So the, the idea then that, that the monasteries were these sanctuaries of learning in which all property was held in common, the Benedictines in particular, Benedict said in, that not a book nor a pen nor ink could be held privately, it was shared. But the funny thing is, what I discovered was that Benedict was not interested in learning, he was interested in prayer. The nuns and monks only wanted to look into the face of God, not turn the page on another book. And in fact, there was an anti-intellectual sensibility in the early monasticism because learning is a source of, well, you won't believe this, but learning can be a source of pride in some people. <laughs> I, I don't understand it, actually. And I've never really experienced it except at every faculty meeting I've ever attended. And so the Benedictine monasteries were filled with a, an anti-learning sensibility. Not only pride, not only do learned people get all boastful and, and, and full of hubris, learned people can trip very easily into heresy and blasphemy. They can say things like, no, Jesus actually didn't mean that, that the poor will always be with us. He meant they, they will be with us until we do something about it. And so the whole idea that the learned would have an opinion about the gospel, 
was dangerous. And so how did learning come to the monasteries? Well, I was fascinated and fully absorbed because it was going to ruin my thesis if I had this lovely, common, property sanctuary. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the sponsorship. How does a monastery get started? It's gorgeous. A lord or a noble who's living a kind of wild and willful life decides that I've got this world conquered. What about the next? I better do something about that. He would go into a field that wasn't doing too well, wasn't really producing all that much, was a little bit swampy. He would cut a turf out of that field and carry it to the altar. He would put that turf on the altar and say, I give this to God. I'm buying my way. Well, he wouldn't say this. I'm buying my way to heaven. It's not that bad. You could drain it. Stuff will grow there. And the monasteries were sponsored properties that existed apart from the world. He pulled that bit of land, larger than the turf, larger than the, the cube of, of, of turf that he provided, soil. He would give the land a sufficient to support the monastery, and that land was removed from the world. It was also removed from the control of the local bishop. It was an autonomous space, and the autonomy is critical to learning. Benedict, who did not like learning, said the monk should read for three or four hours a day the prayer and the liturgy. Big mistake. You give people autonomy, you take care of their bread, you give them three or four hours to read, you put a quill in their hands and you give them a beautiful text with wide open margins, and what do they start to do? They start writing in those margins and asking questions that should not be asked and pointing out contradictions and starting to start to establish commentaries running up the margins and criticize and argue with others and do it all anonymously because they're humble. There's no pride in criticizing what the other nun or monk has written. Pointing out the contradictions, this was Abelard's big game, pointing out the contradictions, sick et non, pointing out the contradictions in the Bible is a mental exercise that challenges you to get into the mind of God, which apparently is maybe a little contradictory at times. So this idea that learning could begin to unfold from the circumstances, the institutional circumstances, hadn't happened in the classical era. Began to happen in the monasteries, but bead got it right. Bede came out and said, I'm learning. But I'm only learning for the value of others. My learning is a service to the other monks in our abbey to help them get closer to God. And the books that I'm writing about time and astrology and astronomy and all of this work is an attempt to find, well, first of all, when the date, when Easter starts properly, but secondly, to help others appreciate the work of God. That Bede began to gather material on the tides to understand how God had set the world in motion. And all of this justification came out of learning as a service to others. Learning as something that others had a right to and we had an obligation to serve. And in all of this, the monasteries had begun to turn the corner on that anti-intellectualism as they began to see the value of learning. Separated from the world, linked in a network of monasteries that shared texts by copying, providing access. Second historical example I want to share with you is Islamic learning and its importation into the West. So we've gone from the early medieval period, the fourth century to the seventh or eighth or ninth century a period in which Islam in the 7th and 8th century, Islam rises, does tremendously well, takes over all of Spain, Iberian Peninsula. Christianity starts to fight back in the 9th and 10th century, retakes, starts to retake Spain, and all of a sudden the scholars are kind of hanging around the edges of these battlefields because they're noticing something about the cities that are being taken over, Toledo, Madrid, Barcelona. They're taking these cities, actually, let's stay with Toledo. They're taking these cities and finding they're full of a kind of learning 
that the West did not have. There was no Aristotle in media, oh, sorry, there was one. Aristotle's categories was the only real Aristotle the early Middle Ages had in terms of the West. Plato, the Timaeus was the only work that they had. And here, these Islamic scholars had 20 or 30 works of Plato and Aristotle. And they were in Arabic. And there were Jews and Christians and Muslims sitting down with these texts, and the Christians had their mouths open. I thought I had all of Aristotle almost memorized, and you're telling me there are 20 other titles? Is there any kind of abbreviated form I could like get this in? And can you help me translate it? And in fact, Toledo became the center of a translation movement in all of Islamic learning, both the Islamic commentaries on Aristotle and Aristotle were translated into Latin in a matter of two centuries. Huge increase in access to learning for the West. And I want you to think about this because it's wrong for me to make historical analogies with today, but I want you to consider this immense influx of learning into the West. Two centuries might not seem hasty in your sensibility. If they'd had twi Twitter, they would have done it in 20 minutes. Translations of Aristotle, one tweet at a time. But in the course of two centuries, all of Aristotle and Plato entered the West, and the West was overwhelmed by it. The monasteries could not handle it. The cathedral schools at Notre Dame, Chartres, other places could not handle it. They needed a new institution. There was just so much learning, it was filling the marketplace. Ooh. And in fact, the masters were like master carpenters and master glassblowers. The masters of Aristotle were standing in the marketplace selling their wares. Hey, I got the physics. I got the metaphysics. I've got on the soul, I've got poetry, and I'm looking for rhetoric. Anyone got rhetoric with Aristotle? And they would sell their services. And then they would unionize and group together everyone who had a little bit of Aristotle, a little bit of Plato, and they would form a guild because, hey, the glass blowers were doing fabulously well. The Venetian glass blowers, man, they, they owned the market. They really invented intellectual property in a commercial sense. You couldn't leave Venice if you knew anything about glass because you would take that knowledge somewhere else. You were, in, in fact, indentured in, in Venice. Not a bad place to be indentured, but it was, it was an intellectual property capital. And so the, the universities formed out of the access. A new institution had to be developed to handle so much learning and begin to explain and justify it. And Islamic learning was fully a part of that. Even though the Crusades were going on, even though Christians were killing Muslims and Muslims were killing Christians, it's as if the learned snuck between the legs of the horses and grabbed onto the texts and consulted with the fallen Muslims and said, listen, could you just help me with these two words right here? I can't quite translate them. We're having real difficulty. And in that way, there was this separate autonomous exchange of learning based on a right of access. And the right of access defines the intellectual property of learning and leads to new, revised, and revitalized institutions, including the Western university system. The Muslims didn't come north. Even the Muslim universities are a little bit controversial about the, the status of their schools, the madrasa. But what came north were the texts, access to the learning. And the texts, in fact, Aristotle could not have been taught, many scholars think, if it hadn't been for the Islamic commentaries. Because, I don't know about you, but Aristotle can be a bit overwhelming at times. And to have all of a sudden all of Aristotle without any educational background in this area could be tremendously overwhelming. But to have a commentary, to have a Sparks Notes translated made all the difference. Let me jump ahead to the Bodleian Library. We're now into the 17th century. Am I going too fast for people here? 17th century. You can see we're almost done. In fact, I'm going to stop at 1710. 17th century. That's 1710, by the way, is the 18th century. 17, so, Bodley is a sardine monger, marries into a sardine family, a former graduate of Oxford University and is very disappointed because the Reformation has wrecked the University of Oxford's library. The college library is okay, but there is no 
university-wide library in, in 1590. The Reformation has devastated it over traces of Catholicism. And so Bodley says, this is a shame. I'm going to build you a library. It's the most amazing letter that's ever been sent to a university president. But it's the donor. It starts with the donor. And Bodley says, I married into a fishmongering family. No, he didn't say that. But we gather that from the context. He married into a fishmonger. He wants to do something. And he says, he's a real take charge kind of guy. He's a Home Depot sort of fellow. He says, I'm bringing the lumber, I'm building the shelves, and we're starting now. The university said, that's terrific, we're so grateful, we don't have any books. He said, I'll take care of that too. And what he did is he reached out to all of his other friends, whether fishmongers or glassmongers or whatever mongers, and said, we need to donate the books. We need to create the learning in a separate space. We need to create, and this part I love, a public library with a K and an E on the end, of course. It's early modern period. A public library. We need to move books out of this private preserve of collectors, the illuminator, and we need to move them into a public space of the library. And he defended that, and to this day, you can go to the Bodleian Library at Oxford, and you can visit the stacks, enter the library. You can fill out a card. It costs five pounds, but there's even a waiver you can apply for welfare for the five pounds, even as a visitor, to get into the Bodleian Library. It's just so precious. The Bodleian Library guarantees not only access the five day, no, you can take no books. No books can be removed from the Bodleian Library. They have to be available for everybody all the time. Even when you take a book, this is my favorite part, you take a book from the shelf, I didn't understand this at first, you have to put a slip in the shelf and explain what table you're working at. Where have you removed that book? I would write on the slip, back off. <laughs> I'm working. And I was told that that wasn't quite the way they did things. And I said, actually, I'm a Canadian, but I've been living in the States <laughs> for a number of years. This sense of the right and what he established and why Bodleian Library is now the largest and the best collection of illuminated manuscripts of any university is people saw that this was a right and an obligation. In fact, they saw it as license. The rich could collect any number of illuminated manuscripts knowing that when they died, they would go to heaven. They would live among these gorgeous texts and then donate them. Ten days, maybe five days, don't risk it. Maybe the last day. Even John Locke on his deathbed gave copies of his own books to the Bodleian Library. He owned up. The two treatises was anonymous. And when he donated it to the, to the Bodleian Library, he made it clear. In fact, the Bodleian Library was so short of money, they wrote to Locke saying, we don't have your two treatises. Would you mind sending us your copy? A, a copy? And this idea that the library exists apart. Now, one last thing that Bodley did that was so important, Thomas Bodley, is he went to all of the printers. By the way, we're in the age of print now. Did you miss the change from illuminated manuscripts? Did I skip Gutenberg too quickly? In the age of print, he goes to all of the printers in London and he says, you have an obligation. You're trafficking in intellectual property. You need to give one copy of every book you print to the Bodleian Library. That was such a smart idea. It worked out so badly, but it's such a smart idea. And they agreed. Because just as the nobles gave land to the monasteries, where did they have their eyes? It's my ticket. I'm going. Giving a copy? What's the big deal? A copy of every book. It took that book and moved it out in the commercial market and said the public library is a separate, distinct intellectual property space. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, and that is this idea of, of authorship and credit of intellectual property. In the monasteries, I forgot to mention that in the margins, even though the notes were anonymous, they started to refer to authors. It started to become important to know whether Jerome or Augustine, or Augustine, whether Jerome or Augustine had made this commentary because it was becoming too confusing. And even though yours might be anonymous because you were humble, even though you wrote in very big letters, 
and filled the margin so nobody else could put anything else near it, you still spoke about how I'm only writing because others have asked me about what Jerome, St. Jerome and what St. Augustine were going on about in their dispute. And they had disputes. They both coexisted in early monasticism, ridiculous monasticism. Jerome had a library you would die for in a supposedly unpropertied space. Really. This idea that authorship became a way of understanding. We credit the author as a right of access to the author's understanding. The coherence of their work is the key construct in terms of authorship. Not ownership, understanding. The possibilities of understanding. And so in the medieval period, there was a sense of intellectual property because we needed to understand the properties of Augustine's theology. We needed to understand what Jerome was concerned about in his translation of the Greek Bible into the Latin Bible and the dispute over key words around the Trinity. Erasmus made his reputation on establishing that the Trinity had been imposed on Jerome's translation. And this idea that authorship is a path to understanding coherence and comprehensibility and I don't need to tell you that that is an intellectual property of text. And nobody was using that word, but everyone was beginning to think about text as authored. Even the gospel. The disputes over the gospel, over Paul's letters, over the authorship of Mark. All of these things revolve not around a disrespect and not around a lack of faith in God, but around a pursuit of understanding. And so what we think about as an author's rights is to be credited. Not to exclude others. No, absolutely the opposite. They are to be credited for inviting others into their work. So finding my history, monasticism, Islamic learning, the famous library called Bodleian, I'd, I'd love to be called, have a library called Bodley, not the, Bo, not the Thomas, whatever his initial was, Bodley Library. No, his library was Bodleian. And I, I mean, there's something about that. It's Bodleian because it, it, every aspect of it is sponsored. If you get a chance to visit the rare book rooms of the Bodleian Library, you will never find a book there. I worked there for a whole quarter, ten weeks with students. We never saw a text that said, purchased by Oxford University. We only saw a text donated by someone who wanted to go to heaven. Whether that heaven was tax exemption, whether that heaven was a tax-free year or not, wasn't clear to me, but every text there has that. And I just had to say to myself, man, that is just so bodily. Now the book donations, the book deposit, which we now have in the United States, and practically every country of the world, the book deposit policy kind of drove the university a little crazy. Because where do you put them all? They ended up selling duplicates. Shakespeare's folio. Jane Austen gave it all away. They were overwhelmed by that policy. But it's still one that stands today, and it is part of the exception. Remember the exceptions? The distinction of intellectual property. 1710, John Locke fights to put an end to censorship. The only copyright in the 17th century was the king saying, I will give you the right to publish Bibles. You can do almanacs. You can do children's books. You, for schools, you can publish them on only one term, and that is that you promise to censor everything you publish. You promise to let us review it, and you promise to register it so we can track down anyone who didn't get their book registered. So the beginning of copyright is this filthy political conspiracy between the king and the printers. Printers get monopolies, king gets censorship. So does the Church of England. Locke says that's not good for learning. Locke says it's driving up the price of books. Virgil is a part of a monopoly. Virgil has been dead for so What is a monopoly to Virgil? What is Virgil to monopoly? So Locke works against it, and so do a lot of other people. And in 1696, the very end of the 17th century, they kill the Book Licensing Act. It's part of the democratization, part of the glorious revolution. 
in England, part of the balance of power that stands today. And what they establish in its place is chaos, unlicensed period of about 15 years in which anything gets printed, no one gets any credit, everything is duplicated as soon as it's printed. People can't tell if they're reading the New York Times or the facsimile of the New York Times that was printed the same day. The New Yorker was hopeless. The covers and where the ink wasn't even dry on the covers. And you would see another copy from someone else and you couldn't tell which is the original and which is the one you want to buy. And, but, and it would be cheaper, so you would know that wasn't the original. So in 1710, they created a, the, what we consider to be the first modern copyright act. 1710, in fact, it's called the Statute of Anne 1710. Many of you know this statute. Yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm preaching to the, the converted. But what's fascinating and needs to be held in your head is a couple of aspects. The Statute of Anne 1710 gives rights to authors for 14 years. Okay, this is kind of a running, what's happened to that? I know, but they could renew it for another 14 years. Well, what's happened to that? It's like 70 years after your death, you have a right still to exclude people from reading your work in order for you to have an incentive. Oh, God bless America. But... In 1710, the first act has something that is so critical for us that we want to hold to. Copyright was invented as an act for the encouragement of learning. Look it up. An act for the encouragement of learning. That is the only Lockean justification for excluding people from other people's work. An act for the encouragement of learning. And in that act, Bodley's book deposit po policy was in place. Now, Glasgow and, and, and Edinburgh were included because uh, there had been a union of Scotland and England. A few more libraries were included, even Cambridge. They hated that at Oxford. There was a book deposit policy. There was even a policy where the Chancellor of the University of Oxford and Cambridge could call Elsevier, Springer, Kluver, Wiley Blackwell in front of them in the chambers of the chancellor and could insist that the prices were overcharged, the prices that were being proposed was an, represented an overcharging and needed to be reduced. They had the power to reduce Elsevier's prices. Can you imagine what a glorious time to be alive <laughs> that was? The statute also set the university presses apart from the London presses because the intellectual properties of learning are distinct and the university presses needed to be protected because they operate in a separate realm. It protected the importing of books because scholars work on the basis of access, not on the basis of exclusion, and they had been excluded from imported texts because of their price, because there was a restriction on who could resell and it complicated things. So ultimately, intellectual property was conceptualized within the world of learning. It was conceptualized, though, as apart from the world on a sponsored basis in which access was absolutely critical. It was sponsored on the value of intellectual property coming from it being autonomous and giving back to the world. And even if Portland State University is not on the stairway to heaven, although I thought I heard it when I was coming up the uh, commons there, it is still a similar kind of principle that the land-grant universities were founded on a similar basis to the monasteries. There needs to be, for learning, a world set apart in order for it to serve the world. And if we lose that distinction... If we commercialize the universities, as many people in the sciences are very, very much concerned about, University Inc., if we lose that distinction, we lose the value of what we do. And history tells us that repeatedly. So what do I want to propose in this age of APC, of article processing charges? What do I want to propose as a way for the social sciences and humanities to fully participate in an open access movement that has taken hold but is not distributed evenly, I want to propose 
a cooperative that says that the intellectual property of the work that we do needs to exist separately from a monopoly market in which it currently operates. And we need to form a cooperative with not the libraries being partners, not the libraries buying membership, not the libraries agreeing to donate or agreeing to sponsor. You're not the sponsors in this case. You are part of the cooperative. You are the collaborators. The libraries and the journals need to form a cooperative. Now, we still need commercial services. We still need web services, and we still need copy editors, and we still need graphic, oh, we, do we ever need graphic designers? <laughs> oh, we still need graphic designers. Pierre J, interesting. PLOS, got some good things going on. But what we need is to come together. That each of you, as an information scientist, as a specialist, as it were, in the trafficking of the intellectual properties of learning, needs to sit down with the editorial committees, needs to sit down with the scholarly societies, and say this is not a vendor-buyer-seller relationship. We are in the same enterprise. We need to buy services, but we need to work and cooperate together. And so what I want to do over the next few years is explore the possibility, the feasibility, of forming cooperatives between groups of libraries and journals. And you are already at the forefront of that. You are sponsoring journals. But you cannot turn the corner that I need turned. And that's the $10 billion corner. Let me just visualize with you for a moment. Let me not lose track of the time either. Let me visualize with you for a moment the $10 billion question. Now you have to visualize with me $10 billion. Okay? Just take a moment. Bigger than all the tables here. Right to the ceiling. $10 billion. Because that's how much you are currently giving to the publishers. You're writing checks for the equivalent of $10 billion that is the claimed revenue of the STM Editors Association. Maybe understated, maybe increasing at a faster rate than they claim, but at any rate, $10 billion is the subscription funding revenue model that operates today. And what we need to do is we need to turn that $10 billion. We don't want to add onto it. We don't want to add APCs onto that $10 billion. We don't want to do charity work in order for that $10 billion to continue. We want to turn that $10 billion into its original intention, into the spirit of every check you have ever approved or written, and that is to advance scholarly communication. But we want to do it on a basis that says scholarly communication is a public right. It is not a commercial service. We want to do it on a basis that says every public library from central Portland around the world, every public library and every public school has a right to the work that we do in these institutions. And $10 billion, I think, and I've worked it out here at the back. I keep turning it upside down. Yes, it is enough. <laughs> I have it right here. $10 billion is enough to publish all of the literature in the world and make it free for everybody. Because the exclusion that is going around right now on that $10 billion is not doing any libraries any good. Nobody would come to my library if the public library had this literature. Not true. Nobody would go to university. No, no, come on, stop it. We need to come up with a plan that takes that $10 billion and says, I'd rather write the check. Ooh, I, the idea of writing a check for $10 billion. Sorry, just kind of gave me a nervous. I'd rather write the check as part of a cooperative. I'd rather sit down with the journal editors and say, how much does it cost? Does it really cost $5,000 to produce an article for sale? Show me. Prove it. Because if it does, I know those diagrams, all very fancy, very precise. Oh, yes, they're high resolution. If it does, we will write the check. We're a cooperative. We agree on what is a fair price. But we don't quite understand 
because it's science, whether it's rocket science or brain science, it shouldn't excuse me, cost any more than an article on philosophy, on the history of Oregon. We should be able to talk about real costs for scholarly communication. And we will agree as a cooperative that pay for those costs. And when we need to improve the website or when we need to have graphic design so people can read the articles more freely, we need to pay for that. We are not graphic designers. We are in charge of the intellectual properties of learning. We are responsible for the quality of learning. And that is where and why we need to sit down. And that is why this concept of a cooperative has taken hold, at least in me. Now, how do we go there? How do we go from the partnerships, the kind, I mean, Martin Eve has got a lovely proposal in which he has partners, but I still feel you're not at the table, you're just writing a check. I don't want you writing a check. I want you sitting down with me as information scientists and helping me improve scholarly communication. And I want you to tell me how to improve OJS. Let's start right there. Now at first, of course, my hands will be over my ears. I'll be whistling and humming, but I'll get over it. And I'll hear you. Because you're ready to put money in it. You're ready to say to me, this is what we need. Article level metrics. Counter and sushi. Whatever it is you want. You help us set the priorities. Because you know readers, you know students, you know faculty and what they want. And this idea and possibility that we can form a cooperative to decide the future of scholarly communication is not a matter of where are we going to find the money. I already told you, yes, you have enough. We have enough money right now to do this. Now, how it's going to start is not by writing a check for $10 billion. No, fantasy land. Not even half that. No, no. What we're going to do is we're going to pilot. What we're going to do is experiment. I have eight anthropology journals who are sharing data with Rain Crow at Spark. Eight anthropology journals, some of which belong to Wiley Blackwell, who have agreed to share their data who have agreed to begin to explore forming a cooperative. Some of them are already open access, some of them are subscription. In fact, cultural anthropology and current anthropology, any anthropology people here? The two leading journals in the field are ready to explore this idea. I have 35, I love this, heterodox economics journals. I'd never heard this concept before. These are heterodox economics journals. And they're Marxist, and they're African-American, and, they, and they are feminist, and they are heterodox. They're a little more hesitant about joining. They're very careful. They're economists. And they want to see spreadsheet analysis. So we've got an interest from the journals. These are society journals. The eight anthropology journals, six of them are societies. They're ready to come to the table. We have big issues about the societies. They get money back from the publishers and oh, what are we going to do what are we going to do about that but in every case we'll do the same thing we'll say okay blackwell wiley blackwell gave you x number of dollars it's about five hundred thousand dollars to the AAA american anthropological association yeah i know surprised me too five hundred thousand um, dollars we're ready to give you that five hundred thousand dollars if you can establish how it contributes to scholarly communication if it really does foster maybe $50,000 better editors in your selection of editors, if it helps you mentor uh, new faculty in terms of their writing and ability to publish, we'll consider that as well. But it is not the function of libraries to, to reduce the conference fees for academic members or membership fees. And so these kinds of tough decisions and debates need to be held. Where ultimately is this headed? Where do we go with this? You are a group of librarians and others who are involved in publishing, and you have taken a step. The cooperative notion will be a gradual exploration of an idea. It may not be viable or feasible, but we need an approach. In June, I'm going to speak to PLOS about this idea. PLOS is the big success story in open access, and PLOS 
is a problem for everyone outside of PLOS. Because PLOS is charging from $13.50 for their mega journal up to $3.28 and change for biology, the highest ranked journal uh, in, in the world, in, in, in the field of biology. Uh, and PLOS has, feels like it has provided a solution to open access. They failed to realize that not everyone has the grant levels of Harold Varmus and company. Not everyone has, as it were, the support of the NIH, the largest funding agency in the world. Um, and so I want to test PLOS's presumption to be contributing to open access and say, you have a model that will not work in the social sciences or humanities, that adds additional costs to research, which reduces the amount of money available for everybody. What would, if you are serious about supporting open access, and I believe they are, the Public Library of Science is what PLOS stands for, then you need to be support and get behind a model that applies to all of the fields. That what great advantage we have with open access is we both understand and see how others are publishing for the first time, and we have an opportunity to level the playing field globally and across the disciplines in a way that is transparent and open and can be argued about. Because PLOS can come back and say, well, we would join because that would help open access, but we have real fixed costs. And again, we would say, show us the costs. We are ready to consider that. PLOS one, zero for copy editing. PLOS one, 30,000 articles a year. Okay, if you produce 30,000 articles a year, you're going to get a big level or degree of support on that basis of productivity. They have a 70% acceptance rate, and I think it's changing the way we think about knowledge. Because it's no longer about the gatekeepers of the editors, it's about competent science being published. And having room for every competently reviewed, I'm sorry, every reviewed article that declares it to be scientifically competent. So those kinds of intellectual property and quality debates and discussions are what we should be about. And I don't want to have those discussions without you at the table. Because you have the expertise that we need. You also have the servers and infrastructure that can help us in this process. And so I want you to consider going forward from this event the possibilities of thinking about a global economic model. It may not be the cooperative, but it needs to be something that is principled, something that recognizes why it is the intellectual properties of learning are distinct, separate, autonomous, sponsored, and how that is operating in many different ways on every one of your campuses, but somehow has been lost sight of in the monopolistic, commercialized world in the exchange of scholarly knowledge. And I'm hopeful that a group like this will be at the center of this change. And I invite you to consider it going forward. Thank you very much.